<clears throat> Thank you, Ellen. Dear friends, grace to you and peace from God, our Creator, and our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please forgive my voice. My son at his first wrestling tournament yesterday. I got a little into it, so. <laughs> in many ways, we are living through a terrible time, especially as Californians. Natural disasters have befallen us, especially fires here in our beloved state. Thousands have become homeless and face a long road to recover their lives. Communities in the bucolic and beautiful town of Paradise, which I know well because my grandparents lived there for quite a while, and I've spent a lot of time there. And the surrounding area too, those small towns around Paradise and this beautiful conifer forest have been affected. Thousand Oaks and other communities like Malibu in Southern California have been affected. Many have been driven from their homes as they burned to the ground in ashes, adding insults to injury. Grief upon grief upon grief. We know they have a long road to recovery, and we as church need to be committed to walking alongside them in whatever form that takes. Wildfires have always claimed homes and lives in California and the West, but never quite like this. And contrary to what some political leaders say, it's not just a matter of breaking up debris from the forest floor, forest floor or cutting down more trees. Forest management matters. It does. But fires correspond to heat, something that we might know intuitively. And our planet is heating rapidly. Our own government's fourth assessment report of climate change outlines this. It was released just last month. And it portends some serious problems due to climate change. Twelve areas of American life will be affected by global warming, including communities that will be disruptive, disrupted, such as paradise, water systems, health, indigenous people, ecosystems and ecosystem services, agriculture, infrastructure, coastal areas, where a large population of the poor live, frankly, in coastal areas, and tourism. The biggest surprise to this report was the damage climate change will do to the economy, which we've heard something very different for years. This past week, we lost another elder statesman, George H.W. Bush, the one, the uh, 1988 presidential uh, winner on the Republican ticket. Interesting story about Bush I heard recently. In 1988, the same year he won the election, James Hansen of NASA, a climate scientist, published a paper about atmospheric levels of CO2 and how they could easily reach a dangerous tipping point that could dramatically change Earth's natural systems and weather patterns permanently. Because of this science, Bush actually campaigned on the promise of tackling this threat of global warming. With all of the best minds our great land could muster, we would lead the way on addressing this potentially catastrophic problem, he said, as we always have in the United States of America. That is, until his chief of staff, John Sununu, turned it into an economic issue, putting the kibosh on the whole initiative, saying that to take action to mitigate a warming climate would harm the U.S. economy. Or the business community, such a large government-led initiative, which would include lots of regulation and new taxes, did not look attractive. And so that has become a standard political talking point ever since. We love to do something about the environment, but after we fix the economy. Have you heard this one before? We felt it before, we thought it before. Of course, fixing the economy is a task that will never be fully accomplished because it's always imperfect. So that's another way of saying the environment and the natural world just isn't really a priority for us. And now we know the exact opposite. In fact, it's inaction on climate change, on doing something to mitigate it that will harm us not only animal species and weather patterns, perhaps catastrophically, in fact, it's the actual economy and the way we usually think of it. Businesses open, people buying and selling things, goods being traded, et cetera, the transfer of wealth, et cetera, all of that will be dramatically and ne negatively affected by climate change. We live in difficult times. This is a difficult, wicked problem with no easy solution. And if we're being honest with ourselves, we're all part of the problem. 
We can't just point fingers at other people as though some other people have caused the problem and we're not part of it. We're all part of it. And because of this, this is one of many challenges maybe that we have in modern life and maybe in our own personal lives. But because of this and things like natural disasters that we've witnessed, wildfires and so forth, perhaps Jesus' words, these, this terrible text, and the end of time and so forth hits close to home for us. In any way. On that day, you will see floods and fires and natural disasters and so forth, and the skies and the heavens shaking. This is but the beginning of what is to come. It's difficult to know how to preach on these texts in an otherwise happy season of Advent. But like a fig leaf, Jesus says, which reveals when it is about to bear fruit, these signs of nature, while disturbing, show something new about to come into being. And so, as troubling as they are, they're actually a sign of hope, Jesus says, for his followers. We begin today the season of Advent, which is about waiting, watching, anticipating, and hoping. Pregnancy is the perfect metaphor for this season. We're anticipating something coming. Although pregnancy, I think, has a much more positive and warm connotation than the text today in the Gospel suggests. Waiting and hoping, it seems to me, means something different when you're suffering. If your people truly wait in darkness, as God's people so often have, then the light coming into the world is especially meaningful and powerful. The same way a candle lit in a totally dark room has a big impact. As people living in an age of climate change and potential environmental and natural decline, what does this mean for us? Well, we await Christ's coming, not only at Christmas, which is a kind of looking back, but at the end of time, which is a looking ahead. In a sense, Christ comes to us from the past through the dangerous, dangerous memory that we preserve as church. Dangerous because Christ will always upend our assumptions and our comforts and so forth, uh, for the sake of God's reign and God's presence and what the Holy Spirit is doing, which can always feel a little chaotic. But Christ also comes to us from the future. And the word Advent comes from a Latin word which means arrival. Arrival from the future. That means there's something yet to be revealed to us, which is why we wait in hope. For Jesus and his disciples, what was yet to be revealed was the surprise of his own crucifixion and resurrection. That wasn't supposed to happen to the Messiah. But as we read in the prophet Isaiah, chapter 53, the one to come will suffer to bear the sins of many. What is yet to be revealed to us is still unknown. It remains a mystery, which is why it is both troubling and intriguing at the same time, especially in the midst of bad news, it's sometimes, it's sometimes difficult to know what to make of the future. But we can look to the future with hope as Christians. People who follow a man whose life ended in a most surprising way, but whose presence was a true blessing. Will Jesus coming, whenever, whenever that happens, allow us to stave off catastrophic climate change and preserve our species' future on this planet? I don't know. The signs are pointed in the wrong direction. The ongoing emission of fossil fuels, burning of coal, trashing of oceans, poisoning of our food and water supply, and endangering coastal communities suggests we haven't learned our lesson yet about how to be proper stewards of the planet, which is a sacred trust to us as a human race. But hope is not about scientific data or what we can expect to happen. It is not about risk analysis or weighing priorities. Hope is a theological virtue. It simply is. We don't hope because of what. We hope because of who. Who blesses us? Who claims us? Who walks alongside us as God's people? The, mis the people who walk in darkness have no reason to hope. 
until the mystery and majesty of God's will was revealed in the most unlikely place, in a manger, in Bethlehem. And we carry that same hope with us as we wait for Christ to come.